My name is Jack Dawes, and I've been a park ranger at Elkwood National Forest for the past five years. Located in the rugged backcountry of Montana, Elkwood covers over two million acres of pristine wilderness. It's a beautiful but dangerous place for the unprepared. As a ranger, it's my job to maintain the trails, educate hikers, enforce rules, and respond to emergencies. I grew up in this area and know these woods like the back of my hand. My grandfather was a forest ranger too, so I learned the ropes at a young age. I've hiked every trail, climbed every peak, and camped in every valley within Elkwood's vast borders. There are still areas so remote that few humans have ever set foot there. It's easy to disappear into the depths of this untamed land if you don't respect it. My outpost is near the north entrance to the park. It's just a small cabin with a radio, maps, first aid gear, and enough provisions to survive if I get stranded. Each morning I hop in my dusty old Jeep and head out to patrol. Elkwood only has a handful of rangers spread out over thousands of miles, so we each cover a large swath of ground. My zone is the northwest sector, spanning hundreds of rugged acres. A typical day involves cleaning up campsites, maintaining trails, assisting hikers in need, watching for fires or illegal activity, and documenting wildlife. Bears and mountain lions are common, so I'm always armed. So far I've been lucky to avoid any close calls with aggressive animals. Not many dangers exist that I can't handle alone. I enjoy the solitude out here, just me and nature. Weeks can pass without seeing another person. At night I often sleep under the stars instead of heading back to my cabin. Gazing up at the Milky Way makes me feel small, but connected to the universe. This wilderness has a magic to it that most folks miss racing through their daily grind. Out here, the rhythms of the earth govern your clock. But a park ranger's job isn't always peaceful. Injuries, deaths, and disappearances occur if visitors make stupid mistakes. I've rescued my share of green hikers who go out poorly equipped, and I've recovered bodies too, victims of falls, drownings, animal attacks, or exposure. That's the ugly side of the job. It wears on you over time, seeing such preventable tragedies play out. But it motivates me to educate people about respecting nature's power. I thought I had seen everything these woods could throw at me. But a few weeks ago, something happened that shook me to my core. It was a quiet night on patrol. A half-moon cast dim light onto the endless rows of lodgepole pines that surrounded my jeep on the overgrown forest road. I had the radio cranked country music playing softly as I bounced along, my headlights cutting a path through the dark woods. As a park ranger in these remote parts, I was used to spending countless hours alone, patrolling for any issues that might arise. But despite the isolation, I felt calm and at peace in the forest I knew so well. I was nearing the end of an uneventful eight-hour shift. My partner Carl usually split these long patrols with me, but he had called in sick. Didn't bother me none to ride solo, but the graveyard shift could wear on you when the caffeine wore off. I glanced at my watch, 1.47 a.m., and let out a yawn. Wouldn't be long before I could head back to the ranger station and crawl into bed. Seemed like this night would pass without incident, just the way I liked it. I was contemplating turning around when a faint noise in the distance caught my attention. I turned down the radio and listened close. At first it was barely audible over the hum of the jeep's engine, but then it grew louder. A blood-curdling scream echoing from deep within the forest. My hands gripped the steering wheel tight as I heard it again, the terrified shriek of someone in mortal danger. It turned my gut to ice. There shouldn't have been another soul out here at this hour. I froze for a moment, unsure if my exhausted mind was playing tricks. But the desperation in those screams was unmistakable. Someone miles back in the woods needed help. I threw the jeep into gear and hit the gas, racing towards the source of that chilling cry. The vehicle jostled violently over rocks and roots as I picked up speed. I flipped the siren and sprayed the high beams through the trees, searching for any sign of the person in distress. Those agonizing screams echoed two more times before fading out. I pushed the old jeep to its limits, careening down the dirt road. 
the forest became a dark blur around me. Finally, I slid to a stop where the road ended, listening intently. But suddenly the woods had gone silent as a grave. I killed the engine and lights. With trembling hands, I readied my rifle, scanner, flashlight, and first aid kit. This was prime grisly territory, so I couldn't be too cautious. But some intuition told me a dangerous animal wasn't the culprit here. I moved quickly in the direction the last scream had emanated from. Sweeping my light back and forth, I called out reassuringly. No reply came. The beam revealed no movement or odd shapes. I continued deeper into the brush, adrenaline pulsing through my veins. The forest remained still except for the needled branches scratching against my jacket. Even the crickets had gone mute. I scoured the area thoroughly, finding no signs of people or animals. Part of me refused to believe those agonized cries had just been my imagination. They had seemed so vivid, so close. Yet not a single shred of evidence was here. Reluctantly, I made my way back to the jeep, just as the sky began to purple with dawn's first light. Whatever had produced those screams was gone without a trace. For now. Exhausted, I drove back to the station as the sun peeked over the ridges. I kept replaying those chilling screams in my mind. I knew every inch of these woods, yet I couldn't explain what I'd heard. As much as I wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the night, some instinct told me to stay alert. I decided to hike back to the spot after sunrise to investigate further. The golden morning light revealed details my flashlight had missed. Right away I noticed a disturbance in the underbrush where something large had trampled through. Kneeling down, I spotted several massive footprints sunk deep in the soft soil. They appeared human in shape, but far larger than any man's. Measuring with my ruler, I estimated the length at 16 inches. No known animal left tracks like that. Nearby, a sapling was snapped clean in half and covered in unusual claw marks. The leaves and earth showed further signs of a violent struggle. Scraps of torn, bloody clothing clung to the brambles. I bagged a shred of plaid flannel, perhaps torn from a shirt. But other than footprints and scuffs, I found no complete articles of clothing or camping gear. It was like whoever had been here vanished without a trace. Or was taken. That thought sent a chill through me despite the blazing sun. What happened last night was no illusion. Not with evidence this concrete left behind. But the implications were disturbing, even unbelievable. I couldn't explain it logically, no matter how long I lingered there analyzing the scene. With a shrug, I hiked back to radio the station and file an incident report, though I doubted anyone would believe me. Back at the ranger station, I described the events in full detail to my superior, Ranger Jennings. He eyed me skeptically, arms folded across his barrel chest. I showed him the shoe print moldings I had made along with the shredded flannel. He examined them briefly before shaking his head in dismissal. No offense, Jack, but working solo you were likely exhausted last night. The mind plays tricks in the deep wilderness when you're fatigued. These prints could belong to any large man out there, and clothing scraps sometimes get left behind. As for the screams you heard, our ears pick up strange sounds at night that seem real. But I'd bet my pension you imagine them. We've never had issues with grizzlies or lions in that region, and we sure as hell don't have Bigfoot running around. He laughed heartily as I stood there looking defeated. I had expected resistance, but his outright mockery irked me. I knew what I had experienced, yet arguing would only make me seem more unhinged. So I bit my tongue as Jennings dismissed me, saying he'd file the report as a curious incident, but would otherwise ignore it. Crestfallen, I retreated to my cabin for some sleep. But perplexing questions kept me tossing and turning all day. I prayed for answers tonight on my next patrol, because my gut said something sinister lurked out there in the shadows. And it had only just begun. Dusk fell, and after a quick bite, I headed out on patrol again. I was anxious to check the site from last night and see if any fresh clues had surfaced. An unsettled feeling gnawed at me that I couldn't seem to shake. 
the woods felt different now, almost watchful, as my headlights cut through the gloom. I nearly jumped when the radio crackled unexpectedly. See anything weird out there yet, Jack? came Carl's sarcastic drawl. Word had spread fast about my bizarre report. Just the normal wilderness sounds, I replied curtly. Don't go shooting Sasquatch now, he said with a laugh before signing off. I gripped the steering wheel angrily. Why wouldn't anyone take me seriously? I wasn't some rube prone to fits of fantasy. Either way, I resolved to get proof to shut them up once and for all. Nearing the location of the screams, I killed the lights and engine. As I sat listening intently, that same eerie silence from last night fell over the forest. The hairs on my neck stood up. Something felt off. I stepped out and swept my flashlight slowly about. Only the swaying of pine boughs moved in the beam's path. No clues materialized as I searched thoroughly in expanding concentric circles. An owl hooted, making me jump. Get a grip, I told myself. I was about ready to give up when a faint cry pierced the night. My heart seized as it repeated, the same drawn-out shriek as before. I sprinted recklessly towards it, branches whipping my face. This time the scream sounded much closer. But as suddenly as it started, it went dead quiet. I halted in a muddy creek bed, panting and listening desperately. Where was it coming from? How could something shriek that loud and then vanish so quickly? Over the next week, I dedicated all my time to patrolling the area where I had heard the screams. I went out morning, noon, and night, hoping to find some trace of whatever had made those sounds. But each time, I came back empty-handed, with not even a stray footprint left behind. During the day, I would do slow, methodical grid searches, leaving no stone unturned. I knew these woods like the back of my hand, but found nothing out of the ordinary. At night, I sat for hours in utter stillness, straining my ears for the faintest noise. Aside from the usual crickets, owls, and deer, the forest remained eerily quiet. My fellow rangers started saying that I was obsessed. They said I was chasing ghosts, seeing patterns where there were none. But I knew what I had heard and felt. Something dangerous lurked in these woods that I couldn't explain. I just needed to gather more evidence to prove I wasn't crazy. But days turned into weeks without any tangible breakthroughs. I hiked until my feet blistered, listening until my own blood pulsing filled my ears. Yet each patrol proved an exercise in frustration. No footprints, fabric, blood trails, or other clues materialized. It was maddening. I began to worry that whatever had made those screams was gone for good. Perhaps it had only been passing through and moved on from Elkwood. But my gut still nagged that an ominous presence hid in these woods. I just had to keep looking. Carl and the other rangers grew less sympathetic and more scornful of my efforts as the weeks dragged on. They started making snide remarks when they thought I was out of earshot. Jack's chasing his imaginary friend again. Maybe we should get him counseling, Carl chuckled one morning at a briefing. I gritted my teeth and ignored him. Later, though, Carl came striding up to me with a smug expression. No luck finding Bigfoot again today, eh, Jack? Why don't you do your actual job and stop this nonsense? I whipped around angrily. I know you all think I'm crazy, but I'm not making this up, damn it. I heard something out there. I'm not making this up. Carl got right in my face. There's nothing to prove except that you've lost your marbles. No monsters live in these woods except the ones in your delusional head. We stood there glaring at each other until Ranger Jennings broke it up. I stalked off fuming, their harsh words burning me. Doubts crept in that maybe I really was chasing phantoms. But it seemed the only way to redeem myself was to find some evidence, once and for all. Hitting dead ends, I decided to research local folklore for clues about mysterious creatures sighted in Elkwood over the years. Native American legends told of a hairy wild man of the woods called a Sasquatch. Old pioneer tales mentioned hearing unexplained screams at night. 
There were even scattered reports in modern times of campers hearing strange cries and finding odd prints. I interviewed some elderly lifetime residents, but most just dismissed these accounts as fantasy. One old-timer named Walt claimed his uncle had a run-in with a huge, foul-smelling beast back in the 1950s. It terrified his uncle so badly, he refused to step foot in the woods again. Walt drew me a detailed sketch of the ape-like creature, standing over eight feet tall. He said it had blood-curdling screams that echoed for miles. I felt a chill looking at the lifelike sketch. Could something like this really inhabit these woods? Most considered Bigfoot a myth, but a few sightings had me questioning what might be possible deep in the untamed wilderness. My research provided no hard evidence, only unverified stories. But it showed I wasn't the only one who had heard chilling sounds that couldn't be explained. Whatever lurked out there, I hoped I could document it with modern technology. Proof would both solve this mystery and restore my credibility. I decided to thoroughly rig the area with cameras capable of night recording. If this creature was mostly nocturnal, motion-activated low-light footage might capture it in action. I trekked out and concealed several camouflage trail cameras high in trees with wide views. To avoid theft, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. For several weeks, I hiked daily to quietly swap memory cards and batteries. It was time-consuming to check weeks of footage, but I diligently scanned each night looking for anything unusual. On a few cards, branches triggered motion and gave me false hope. But review after review revealed empty woods with no unexplained shapes or sounds. I started to worry my technique was flawed. The cameras had limited range and battery life. Perhaps the creature avoided them somehow, or only passed through that area rarely now. My window of opportunity could be closing if it moved on or wised up. But I couldn't monitor the entire massive forest this way. The next full moon night would be my best chance to lure it out. And hopefully, cameras in just the right spots would finally capture the proof I desperately needed. The night of the full moon, I was glued to the monitor, hoping desperately for a breakthrough. I had moved some cameras to new locations earlier that day, maximizing coverage, all I needed was a few seconds of clear footage to justify what I had heard and felt. But as the hours ticked by, nothing appeared except the usual nocturnal wildlife. Around 2 a.m., when creature activity peaked previously, several cameras mysteriously went dead. Frustrated, I checked backup batteries and connections, but couldn't get them running again. One by one, Motion sensors failed like something was intentionally sabotaging them. By sunrise, not a single camera was functioning. Scouring the footage again revealed no clues, just more empty darkness. Something strange had caused the mass failure, but the end result was another dead end. I took it as an ominous sign that I was up against a cunning adversary. It would not be so easily captured through conventional means. My window of opportunity was closing fast. Skepticism from others grew daily, eroding my confidence. Soon there would be no trails left to follow as autumn approached. I had to take matters into my own hands and confront this creature directly. Damn the risks and warnings of others. The beast's eerie screams still haunted me. Tonight, I would venture deeper than ever alone under the moon. One way or another, I would find the answers I sought. I told no one of my plans to hike solo into the remote backcountry in pursuit of answers. They would just declare me reckless and suicidal. Perhaps I was both. But the itch to unravel this mystery had become an obsession I could no longer resist. I had to know what stalked these woods. That evening I loaded ample supplies and weapons into my rucksack. I placed a GPS tracker into my boot for good measure. The moon lit my way as I marched silently into an unfathomably deep wilderness few humans had ever laid eyes on. Adrenaline fired through my veins. Ages seemed to pass under towering old-growth pines. The calling of an owl or skittering of a squirrel nearly jumped my skin. But no other sounds broke the stillness. Finally, 
I stopped at a moonlit meadow miles from any trail. This seemed like a prime habitat for the creature to hunt. I scaled a pine and waited, rifle scope sweeping for the slightest movement. Hours ticked by without any noticeable activity. But just as I was losing hope, a distant cry pierced the calm. My pulse pounded as it repeated, closer now. Suddenly, the woods fell deathly silent. I steeled myself for confrontation as the moonlight illuminated the meadow brightly. Then, at the far tree line, a dark shape appeared. My breath halted in my throat. Too big to be any ordinary animal, it crouched there staring right at me with eyes that glinted. Adrenaline flooded my senses. The creature remained crouched at the forest's edge, its eyes reflecting the moonlight like two malevolent beacons in the darkness. It was covered in shaggy fur, with powerful limbs and an ape-like build. I froze, not daring to move a muscle as its gaze stayed locked on me. Slowly, it began creeping out into the moonlit meadow on all fours. It moved with a deliberate, stalking gait that chilled my blood. Step by step, it drew nearer to the pine I was perched in, sniffing the air. I raised my rifle, steadying it on a branch as I lined up the crosshairs on the beast's bulky frame. My finger trembled over the trigger, but I held my fire. The creature was now just thirty yards away at the base of the pine. It rose up on its hind legs, standing at least eight feet tall. Swinging its huge head from side to side, it scanned the tree branches intently. A low rumble emanated from its throat, and I could hear the scrape of its claws against the bark. The monster clearly knew I was here, but could not yet pinpoint my location. Suddenly, it reared back and unleashed an earth-shattering roar. The sound was like a combination of an enraged bear and an ape-like scream all in one. It echoed for miles across the forest. I had to clasp my hands over my ears. It was so deafening. The creature bellowed again and again, making the entire tree shake. It was an obvious challenge meant to flush me out. Realizing I was trapped, I searched desperately for an escape route. About fifty yards to my left, a sturdy branch extended from a neighboring pine, just within jumping distance if I could gather the courage. As the roaring finally ceased, I inched my way out onto a quivering limb, rifle strapped across my back. Just as I prepared to leap, the branch cracked loudly. The beast's head whipped around, zeroing in on me. Our eyes met for a brief moment, and I saw recognition flash in its glare. I jumped just as a massive clawed hand swiped the spot where I had been perched. It missed me by inches, raking bark that exploded in my wake. I crashed painfully onto the adjacent branch, scrambling to get upright. Behind me, the creature bellowed in rage at having lost its prey. Without hesitation, it grabbed the trunk and began climbing with terrifying speed. I turned and ran for my life, leaping wildly from branch to branch through the pines. I could hear the monster thrashing through the trees just yards behind. Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I fled for my life. Suddenly I lost my footing and tumbled from a branch, slamming down hard onto the forest floor. The wind was knocked out of me, and my ankle twisted painfully on impact. Gasping, I glanced up to see the dark shape barreling down the trunk right at me. I flipped onto my back just as it landed where I had fallen, digging its claws into the soil. We were now face to face, the creature hunched over and breathing heavily. Its hot breath washed over me, and I could smell its pungent, animal-like stench. It bared its jaws, revealing long yellow fangs. There was no mercy or humanity in its eyes as it readied for the kill. This was an apex predator that would show me no pity. As it reared up to slash me with its hooked claws, I desperately grabbed my rifle and fired point-blank into its chest. The shot echoed through the woods, and the creature staggered back, bellowing in pain. Dark blood streamed from its wound, but incredibly, it remained on its feet, shaking its head in rage. I fired twice more, striking its shoulder and neck. The bullets only seemed to further enrage the behemoth. I realized I was outgunned by this monster's sheer mass and power. 
As it loomed over me again for the final blow, I closed my eyes and prepared to meet my end. Suddenly, a chorus of distant screams rang out. The creature halted and glanced around nervously. More eerie wailing arose from multiple directions in the woods. It was now the monster's turn to look panicked and confused. Seizing this distraction, I clawed desperately away from the creature, dragging my injured leg behind me. The beast looked back at me, wavering with indecision. Finally, it turned and rushed off toward the cries on all fours, disappearing swiftly into the forest. I lay there stunned, unable to believe I had escaped. The screams faded, and soon the woods were still again. The creature was gone, for now. But without a doubt, more of its kind lurked out here. I had to get to safety and warn people before it returned to finish me off. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I limped back in the direction I had come. Each step was torturous, but I dared not stop. The night felt even darker and more menacing now in the wake of my encounter. Relief washed over me when the meadow came back into view. But just as I neared the far tree line, an earth-shattering roar exploded behind me. I spun to see the creature burst from the bushes, barreling at me on all fours. Blood still oozed from its wounds, but its fury was unabated. I raised my rifle and fired my few remaining rounds blindly as it charged. The bullet struck its thick hide and torso, but barely slowed the rampaging beast. In desperation, I turned and scrambled towards the trees as fast as my bad leg allowed. The heavy footfalls closed in, the ground shaking beneath its weight. I could feel its enraged breath at my heels as it swiped. At the last second, I dove forward just beyond its grasp, hitting the dirt hard. The creature slammed violently into the trees right behind me. I heard it roar in pain and fury. Glancing back, I saw it slumped at the base of a pine, shaking its head in confusion. My last wild shot must have dazed it, but it would only be temporarily subdued. Ignoring fiery pain, I pushed myself up and limped into the darkness of the woods. Behind me the sounds of the creature regained composure, smashing trees in its rage. But I had gained some distance now. Step by agonizing step, I retreated, pushing my limits to escape. The glow of dawn in the sky ahead kept me moving. My whole body ached from the night. But there was no time to rest. I knew those beasts likely tracked prey using keen scent. My only hope was to put distance between us before they picked up my trail again. I chose a direction at random and started limping as swiftly as my tired legs allowed. The cold morning air burned my lungs and my twisted ankles screamed in protest. But fear kept me pushing hard. I was in foreign territory, many miles from the nearest trail or road. Still, following any bearing seemed safer than waiting for those creatures to regain my scent. I scrambled over fallen logs and waded through frigid streams, using them to obscure my path. Above, the pines came alive with birdsong while I remained wary of every little sound. The forest no longer seemed still and peaceful now that I knew what lurked within its depths. I kept glancing back, dreading the sight of those beasts bounding after me. But for the moment at least, I appeared to have slipped away undetected. After two hours of staggering onward, I finally collapsed against a boulder, spent. My adrenaline high had burned off, and my twisted ankle and bruised body screamed for rest. I fumbled for my radio, hands shaking. This is Ranger Jack Dawes. Request immediate evacuation. Only static hissed in reply. I checked my GPS and swore. The signal couldn't penetrate this deep into the unmapped valley. There would be no helicopter ride out of here. I was well and truly alone. I assessed my few survival options. I had fled directly downslope, so following a creek should theoretically lead me out eventually. But it could take days to walk out, exposed to the elements and those deadly predators. Alternatively, I could try waiting by the radio for help but it seemed unlikely anyone would come searching soon. As I debated my next move, the forest suddenly fell eerily silent. 
The chirping birds and humming insects went mute. All I could hear was the rush of the creek and my own panicked breaths. A chill ran through me. Something was close and watching my every move. I peered cautiously upward and spotted a shutter in the pines several yards back. The treetops swayed and pine needles drifted down. Then I saw a large, dark shape lunge from one trunk to another in pursuit. It paralleled my path, using the height advantage to track me. My only advantage was it could not pinpoint my location if I stayed beneath the pines. I rose shakily and continued down the creek, careful to remain under cover. All stealth was now paramount. The creature followed patiently, herding me deeper into its domain. Soon the icy creek plunged over a rocky ledge, forcing me back on land. With dawning horror, I realized I had been expertly manipulated into a canyon with only one way out. I was cornered and out of options. Just then, a deep howl echoed through the gorge. The creature had trapped its prey. Frantically, I scanned for any possible sanctuary and spotted an old wooden cabin nestled against the canyon wall. I limped desperately across the open ground and found the door unlocked. The musty interior was mundane, but it was a fortress compared to the exposed woods. Outside, heavy footfalls surrounded the cabin, awakening primal fear. I quickly barricaded the door with a heavy desk and stacked furniture at the window. But the rotting wood and glass would never withstand a determined assault. As an afterthought, I grabbed a rusty hunting knife from above the fireplace. It was poor protection against such beasts, but better than nothing. I considered trying to scramble out the back door and down the canyon for a head start, but I was too slow and exhausted to possibly outrun the creature on two legs. My best and only option was to bunker down and pray the cabin would shelter me until help arrived. But even that hope was flimsy as the decaying structure creaked. Outside, those lumbering steps circled hungrily. Soon it would lose patience and rip this fragile cabin open, unleashing its primal fury on me. All I could do was hunker low out of view and brace for the inevitable showdown. A heavy thud on the roof made dust rain down. Sinister scratching noises rose from all around the cabin as clawed hands tested the walls and windows for weakness. Then the glass exploded inward as a fist punched through. I dropped to the floor as shards flew, listening to that hand fumble around for the latch, blocked by the desk I had shoved into place. Angrily, the creature bellowed and shoved against the barricaded door, but the sturdy piece of furniture prevented it from bursting inside. Enraged by being denied easy access to its prey, the beast began tearing at the roof and remaining windows, smashing anything it could reach. The cabin trembled under the assault. I knew once that ancient door gave way, my fate would be sealed. The weak blade in my hand offered only the cold comfort of choosing how I died in these last desperate moments. As I crawled to a far corner, my hand brushed something hard under a moth-eaten blanket. A shotgun. I quickly loaded two shells and chambered around. The beast's roars were deafening between each vicious strike against the cabin walls. Any second now those claws would finally smash through and rip into my fragile flesh. But I would not go down quietly. A hairy arm smashed through a side window, groping for the latch. I raised the shotgun and fired point-blank into the limb. An enraged howl shook the cabin. Dark blood splattered the walls as I chambered another shell. At the front door, claws tore furiously at the gnarled wood. I fired again through a shattered window, driving the monster back temporarily. My defiant shots would only antagonize the beast further. But the fleeting sense of power felt better than cowering helplessly. However, my limited ammo meant the creature had all the time needed to get in. All I could do was brace to meet my end with one last act of futile defiance. I reloaded the shotgun with trembling hands, waiting for the final assault that would tear me to pieces. The cabin was utterly silent, except for the thud of my heart. Suddenly I heard heavy footsteps padding away from the cabin door. Had I wounded the creature critically, or angered it into retreat? Cautiously, I crept to a broken window and peered out. 
At the tree line, the hulking shape lingered, watching the cabin intently. Blood matted the fur around its shoulder where I had shot it. The brute's eyes burned with fury and hunger. I searched every corner of the battered cabin for anything that might aid my survival. But aside from the shotgun, now empty, the place was stripped bare. Escape through the door or damaged walls remained impossible. The only hope was that the creature would lose interest eventually, but its tenacity so far made that seem unlikely. I slumped against the back wall in despair. But then, my hand felt a gap behind the buckled bookcase. Shoving it aside, a dark hole was revealed. Some sort of old tunnel. There was no telling where it led, but anywhere seemed better than waiting here to be slaughtered. With effort, I squeezed into the narrow, claustrophobic shaft on my hands and knees. My flashlight scarcely lit more than a few feet ahead. Behind me, the bookcase swung partially back into place, hiding this escape route. I said a silent prayer of thanks for this deliverance, however precarious, then began crawling blindly ahead into the unknown. Jagged rocks tore at my knees and hands as I crawled aimlessly forward. My flashlight revealed only endless more of the same, black, confining nothingness. The air was dead and stale, devoid of life. But anything was better than being ripped apart back in that cabin. At intervals I paused to catch my breath, ears straining for any sound of pursuit. But only my own thudding heart and the skittering of insects kept me company. The absolute darkness and claustrophobia threatened to crack my mind. Still, I crawled onward praying this path might lead to redemption. Suddenly, a deafening roar exploded directly behind me. I scrambled forward in panic, expecting to be torn from the tunnel at any moment by those ruthless claws. But the narrow shaft prevented the beast from reaching very far. For the first time, the cramped mine provided protection rather than feeling like a trap. The creature thrashed and bellowed in fury, unable to access its cornered prey. It could only snap angrily and swipe at air, gaining no purchase. Desperately, I crawled until the roars faded into silence. But I knew the beast was likely just retreating back outside to stand guard until I emerged. There would be no easy escape. I crawled on bloody knees for what felt like miles, fully expecting to find my passage blocked. But by some miracle, the narrow tunnel remained just passable. A tight section collapsed around me, pinning my torso excruciatingly. The jagged rocks pierced my sides as I struggled forward. With no other options, I clawed desperately at the loose rubble, bloodying my nails and fingers raw. Every tiny bit of progress was agonizing as the rocks ground my ribs. But centimeter by centimeter, I finally wriggled free after what felt like hours of torture. I lay gasping beyond the choke point, nearly broken. The temptation to just give up and rest was overwhelming but I forced my shredded body onward. The claustrophobic miles crawled on endlessly. There were times I thought the air grew thinner and I would be buried alive by a cave-in. But finally, miraculously, the tunnel began trending upward. Fresh air kissed my face instead of the musty dampness. With my last ounce of strength, I clawed my way up a steep rubble choke. Suddenly, my hand broke the surface into open air. I dragged myself out and collapsed on a rocky slope, overwhelmed. By the slanted light piercing the pines, it was late afternoon. Somehow I had crossed deep under the mountain and emerged miles from where I entered. I was badly cut, bruised, and utterly spent. But I had miraculously survived the tunnel and beast. Tears streamed down my filthy cheeks at the thought. I was unwilling to move from that spot, content to just lay there breathing sweet air. But I knew I still had to find a way out of these woods before nightfall. I forced my tattered body to rise. Staying here exposed would be suicide if that creature came searching. I limped downhill in search of salvation. I wandered the backcountry slopes for an hour, searching for anything familiar. 
Just as panic crept in that I was irrevocably lost, I spotted a faded trail marker. It was the old Loon Lake Trail I had hiked a thousand times. I nearly shouted in relief and joy. This well-worn path wove gradually downhill for many miles. I set off as quickly as my legs allowed, one hand tracing the blazes on the trees. They were beacons of hope guiding me to safety. The late sun pierced the canopy in shafts, lighting my way. I paused at a bend to drink from the icy creek. In the stillness, I listened intently. Only a light breeze rustled the underbrush. The creature was not stalking me, for now at least. I pushed on down the winding trail. At last, the sun sank behind the ridge, casting the forest into shadow. Utter exhaustion overcame me. I could go no further stumbling blindly in the darkness. My shredded feet and spasming muscles screamed for rest. The trail led me to a large oak with low-hanging branches. Gingerly, I climbed up and wedged myself between two thick branches. There I would be hidden from sight and protected on three sides from attack. It was precarious, but far safer than sleeping unprotected on the ground. As I strapped myself in with my belt, a distant, mournful howl echoed through the trees, raising hairs on my neck. The creature was still out there somewhere, likely tracking me. I doubted I had seen the last of it. But for now, I was too drained to feel anything but numb relief at making it this far. My lacerated eyelids sank closed against my will. I had never welcomed sleep so fully. Tomorrow I would hike the remaining miles to safety come hell or high water. Daybreak aroused me from restless sleep. Every inch of my body screamed in agony as I unfolded myself from the tree. But the siren call of home kept me moving. Mile by mile I hobbled down the winding trail as the sun climbed the sky behind me. By mid-morning I reached familiar territory near the ranger station. Tears of relief flowed when the wooden buildings came into view. I staggered the last stretch and collapsed against the porch rail, a battered mess. My torn uniform and deranged shouts brought other rangers sprinting out. I could barely rasp an explanation of the horrors I had witnessed. But I pleaded desperately for them to send armed men to hunt the beast and rescue any possible survivors. They looked skeptical but helped me inside the infirmary. I was delirious with fatigue and trauma, but determined to make them understand the threat before it was too late. After a long rest, I recounted my full experience to Ranger Jennings in his office. He listened with a stony face, arms crossed. When I finished, he shook his head angrily. Do you realize the time and money wasted searching for you these past days? And now you return with these tall tales, despite no evidence found of your claims? I warned against your reckless solo mission. Seems you just got lost and disoriented out there alone. I showed him my injuries and urged that we must return while the trails were still fresh. But he refused to risk more resources on what he figured was a goose chase. We argued heatedly, but he remained unmoved. He dismissed me on leave to rest my mind. My spirit sank, realizing I was still alone in this fight, despite coming so close to death. The next few days I rested and healed my battered body. But mentally, I only grew more agitated being confined indoors. I knew each passing day made evidence deteriorate at the creature's lair. Jennings had made it clear no one would investigate my claims. But I could not just let the matter fade away unresolved. That would only embolden the beast to kill again with impunity. I had to find definitive proof, like a body, scales, fur, or DNA, to get others to believe me. My journal contained detailed maps of landmarks to lead back there. No one could plausibly deny physical evidence. Once I had it, I could rally a hunting party to neutralize the threat. Time was short but waiting idly would only ensure another bloody attack. I had survived. Now it was up to me to prevent future tragedies. A week later, when I had regained some strength, I pleaded my case again to the rangers. 
I tried rousing their courage to organize a search party back to the creature's lair, but none would entertain the idea. They had searched days for me and came back empty-handed. Most thought I was just having post-trauma delusions. Carl confronted me angrily. We're not risking our necks on another of your Bigfoot fantasies. There's no monster out there. You cracked under the stress alone in the woods. Get help and move on before you get someone else killed. I argued passionately, but could not sway them. One younger ranger named James pulled me aside later. I want to believe you, Jack, but you gotta admit it sounds far-fetched without evidence. Bring me some solid proof and I'll help convince the others. His words stuck with me. I was on my own here until I uncovered physical evidence, and my window to act was closing fast. Each day made it less likely I could locate the creature's lair remotely. But I had to try one last desperate effort, for redemption, closure, and the sake of future innocence. The beast was real, and its menace remained. I could not walk away now in good conscience, no matter the risk or cost. Having failed to raise a hunting party, the full burden of stopping this creature fell upon me alone. I spent several days gathering equipment and supplies for an extended solo mission. I cleaned and oiled my rifle thoroughly, stowing ample ammunition. A broad machete and hunting knife would provide last-line defenses up close. Provisions included jerky, nuts, fruit, and a water purifier. My backpack also held flashbangs to create confusion and diversion if needed. I studied my journal's crude forest maps repeatedly to imprint the route to the creature's lair. It would require navigating many miles off trail through treacherous terrain. But I was ready to do whatever was necessary to obtain hard proof or terminate this monster before it could murder again. The night before leaving, I stayed up finalizing my last will and testament. I was under no illusions. If the beast didn't kill me, the harsh, untamed wilderness might easily claim my life alone out there. But after surviving the first round, I was confident I could persevere. And putting down this creature would be a noble purpose to die for if fate demanded that price. It took me two days of grueling hiking to relocate the meadow where I had first seen the creature. The winding game trails and shifting landscape made finding it again difficult. But finally, I stumbled out into the familiar open ground, heart pounding in anticipation. The remains of the mutilated deer carcass still lay at the far tree line, attracting flies. I approached cautiously, rifle raised. The creature had returned here at least once since our encounter. It still lurked nearby, I was certain of that. But where exactly was its lair? Studying the meadow perimeter, I noticed one section of underbrush unusually trampled down. Pushing through it revealed faint trails continuing downhill. I followed them through the thickening forest until the ground turned rocky and jagged. Above a shelf of stone jutted from the mountainside. Wedged underneath was the black mouth of a cave, a perfect hidden sanctuary. I crept up slowly, all senses on high alert. The rocky cavity stretched deep into the mountain, swallowed in darkness. The stench emerging turned my stomach, a charnel house mixture of blood, decay, and musk. Bones and shredded clothing were strewn about the entrance amidst claw marks. I nearly gagged realizing I had found the creature's den. Bracing myself, I slipped inside with the flashlight raised. The beam revealed a nightmarish tableau. Mutilated skeletons and half-eaten carcasses were scattered the length of the wide cavern. Some appeared months or years old, while others seemed disturbingly fresh. The butchered remains confirmed my worst fears. How many had fallen prey over the decades would never be known. With morbid fascination, I documented the gruesome scene, gathering the proof I needed to convince others this threat was real. Collecting as much photographic evidence as I could, I turned to leave the nightmarish cave. But at the mouth, I found myself frozen. A pair of glowing eyes blocked the exit atop a hulking silhouette. My flashlight glinted off its blood-stained fangs as the creature hunched and tensed to attack. 
I raised my rifle, shouting madly, and fired point-blank at the beast. It recoiled with an enraged roar, slashing the air in front of it. My bullets seemed to barely penetrate its thick hide. With terrifying speed, it lunged forward and swatted the gun from my hands. The force of the blow knocked me to the ground, stunned. I reached desperately for my machete as the creature stood over me, ready to rip my helpless body to shreds. With a yell, I swung the blade with all my might, cutting into its arm. Howling, it jumped back, giving me a second to grab my fallen rifle and dash deeper into the cavern. But there was only postponing my demise now. This beast would tear me apart down here alone. I had merely trapped myself, inviting doom. I scrambled over the corpses and bones, desperately searching for an exit or weapon in the darkness. The creature snarled, just paces behind despite my head start. In the maze of tunnels I turned around, hitting dead ends everywhere I crawled. Finally, it cornered me against a stone wall deep underground. Behind me waited for only an unscalable rock. Ahead, the beast cut off all hope of escape. It seemed to savor my desperation after I had violated its home and evaded it for so long. Now finally, it had its prey trapped and utterly helpless. This creature could take its time to enact retribution through slow, savage violence. I raised my knife in pitiful defense, preparing to go down fighting. The beast tensed its powerful legs to lunge and rip me apart. I stared into its remorseless eyes, trying to summon some courage for these final moments. But all I felt was primal terror, watching death barrel down upon me. I braced hopelessly for the tearing agony, so far from the light. Then suddenly, a volley of gunshots exploded, echoing through the cave. The creature stopped confused, as bullets peppered the stone around it. From behind me came shouts and blinding flashlight beams. I turned in disbelief to see Ranger Jennings, Carl, and two others in tactical gear rushing into the cavern with weapons drawn. Down on the ground, Jack. We'll handle this, Carl yelled, firing at the beast. Still dazed, I dropped prone. The creature bellowed as the rangers surrounded and pelted it. They had come prepared with tear gas, tasers, and tranquilizer darts. Within minutes, the outgunned creature lay sedated at their feet. I rose shakily, unable to grasp this miracle. Jennings gave me a solemn look, placing his hand on my shoulder. We found your map and tracked you here. 6. Together they battle the frenzied creature with tranquilizers bringing it down. Jennings and the others moved cautiously toward the fallen creature to inspect it and secure the cave. But suddenly it stirred angrily, still resistant to the tranquilizers. In a blur, it leaped up and swiped Carl hard against the cavern wall. He screamed in pain, his chest torn open and bleeding. The other rangers opened fire trying to contain the frenzied beast, but their bullets only further enraged it as it charged about the tight space. I pulled a dazed Carl to safety in a corner, applying pressure to his wound. Meanwhile, the creature was tearing the cavern apart around us, fueled by pain and fury. We need to bring the ceiling down to trap it, I shouted over the gunfire and roars. Jennings glanced around and spotted a cracked pillar that supported a heavy overhang. He fired several precise shots, further weakening the ancient stone column. Take cover, he ordered. We all dove behind stalagmites seconds before the pillar gave way with a rumble. Massive rocks collapsed, sealing half the cavern and burying the creature partially under their crushing weight. Its angry roars were silenced, replaced by groans. We had neutralized the threat at last. It's been a few weeks now. Physically, I mostly recovered from the cuts, bruises, and exhaustion of that week spent lost in the wilderness. Mentally, I'm still processing everything that happened and trying to make sense of it all. There are moments I wonder if it was just a vivid nightmare triggered by stress and isolation. But then, I look at the scars and remember the primal fear that no dream could conjure. Something ancient and deadly lurked out there stalking me. Its screams still echo in my mind when the woods grow quiet. 
I've shared the full story with no one except Ranger Jennings. He believes me, but says we should let the past stay buried. An official report was filed about me getting lost and injured, with no mention of the creature. Jennings wants to avoid a media frenzy. I reluctantly agreed to keep silent, but the secrecy eats at me. I was allowed back on regular duty after the mandatory leave to recover. But I can sense distrust from my fellow rangers after being missing so long. They rumor about post-traumatic stress warping my mind. Only Jennings treats me the same. Being back out patrolling the familiar trails triggers my anxiety sometimes. I find myself watching the shadows between trees, watching for shapes stalking just out of sight. Sudden sounds make me jump now when they never did before. Part of me worries the creature is still out there beyond the marked paths, watching and waiting. Its presence left a permanent mark on this landscape for me. I've considered leaving the ranger service, as I may never fully relax here again after what I endured. But the forest is in my blood, and leaving would feel like surrendering part of myself. I must in time make peace again with its beauty and dangers. That is the only way to take back control from the fear. Jennings wants me to see a therapist to process the trauma among other professionals. I've refused so far, but understand his concern. The nightmares must stop eventually, along with the hypervigilance. What happened cannot define me or dominate the rest of my life. I know the human mind has a remarkable ability to adapt and heal if given time. For now, I'm taking it slowly, sticking to lower risk patrol areas as I rebuild confidence in myself. The outdoors still feels exposed without a rifle in hand, however, but each shift gets incrementally easier. I try focusing on the calming sounds of water flowing over stone, the rustle of squirrels in the brush and the majestic patterns of birds in flight. Nature is healing if you let it in. In the years ahead, I hope to gradually share my account with others who may listen with an open mind. Only through spreading compassionate understanding will our cultures fully mature to live in harmony with these wilds. There are long-held secrets here still being uncovered every day if you pay attention to her subtle signs.